Welcome back to Nature League. This month is all about communication and the way that we send and receive messages. For humans, a lot of that can be auditory, which has to do with sound. I am lucky to be joined by Dr. Lori Slovarp right now, who is an expert about this, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself. I am a speech language pathologist. I work at the University of Montana, and I am a voice specialist. So I teach students about voice disorders. I work with patients with voice disorders, and I also do research on voice disorders. What is sound, what are the components of sound when we're talking about an auditory kind of signal? So sound is basically made of the changing of air and the air compresses and um, opens up and when you have something that's vibrating, the pressure of that air goes back and forth and when that hits our ears, we interpret it as sound. So in humans, We've got to produce a wave, meaning we have to have something vibrate. So I was hoping you could kind of explain how humans are creating vibrations. What's happening uh, for us that makes sound possible? What vibrates in humans is the vocal folds. Mm -hmm. So the vocal folds are two uh, muscles that actually make a V shape in our throat. And so they're connected at the front of the body and that V shape can open and close and that is the entrance of our airway. So when we're talking, the vocal folds are closed so they can vibrate, and when we're breathing, they're open. And when we're making sound, they're in the closed position, but our brain doesn't tell the vocal folds to vibrate. The brain helps you put the vocal folds into the position, and then it's your air coming out on an exhale that makes those tissues vibrate, and that's what creates the wave. So this is a model of the larynx. It's made of several cartilages. So we have this cartilage at the bottom called the cricoid cartilage, and then in the middle here, this is the thyroid cartilage. And where is that on me if I were to put my... Right about there. Mm -hmm. And you can see the thyroid cartilage very easily in men because they tend to have a prominence there, and it's called the Adam's apple. So when you see a man, it, and it just tends to be easier to see in a man, and you see their Adam's apple, that is this very front point of their thyroid cartilage. Cool, so this is oriented, if it were me, kind of... It would be right, right there. <laughs> Excellent. So if I look on the back side of this, now, if this was actually in a human that was mm -hmm. facing me like Brit, what would be behind here is her cervical spine. You can move your larynx to the side and you can touch your spine behind these cartilages. This is what it looks like on the inside. So here's our thyroid cartilage, here's on the inside, and the vocal folds are right in the middle. So when that's put together, uh, the vocal folds are right behind that point. And so those vocal folds essentially open and close, and so when they're open, it goes down to the airway, and when they're closed, we're talking or making sound. And it's so neat to think about how tiny all of that is and yes. the complexity um, that can be in such a small little space and be so important for behavior and mm -hmm. for survival and all these things is pretty remarkable. Yeah. The other interesting thing about it that, that helps us to make a really big sound is what we call resonance. Resonance is basically how the sound is shaped depending on what it's traveling through. So when someone plays a guitar, it's the shape of the guitar that makes the sound pretty. If you took the guitar case away or you shoved a rag in the guitar, it wouldn't sound pretty anymore. So the shape of our throat and in our mouth is what shapes the sound and makes us sound like us or individuals. If you cut our heads off and just had the vocal folds vibrating at the same frequency, they would sound exactly the same. And it's amazing when you uh, have people who can impersonate others. Right. They're changing the shape of their throat with their tongue and their palate and their teeth. And uh, they do some things with the pitch of the voice also, but a lot of what they're doing to make them sound like someone else is changing their resonance. There are some species that are really good at mimicking. And so they actually have adaptations within their voices and all of that structure that lets them change those resonances mm -hmm. to then do a mimicking call of something else or to do something that is then distracting. So humans can make all kinds of noises, of course, but it kind of pales in comparison to some of the, the ranges in pitch that we see in other life on Earth. Especially, I'm thinking really, really high sounds that we can't even hear. Bats are a great example, right? Uh -huh. How are we getting that high of a, of a pitch? How fast of a frequency? How does that happen? Basically, when you think about creatures that make sounds, the smaller the creature, 
the higher the pitch of the sound they're going to make. Men versus women. We all know that women tend to have higher pitches. Well, that's because we have thinner vocal folds. Huh. So what makes the pitch of the sound is whatever it is that's making the sound, it's about what we call cross-sectional mass. So if the vocal fold is stretched and is thin, has small cross-sectional mass, it'll make a higher pitch. When it's squeezed together and it's kind of fat, it makes a low pitch. So bats are tiny, so they make really, really high pitches. And now a word, not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Welcome to this month's Wild Word. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology or origin and history of words related to nature. This month's theme is communication, so we're going to examine a word that is central to chemical communication. That word is pheromone. Pheromones are chemicals produced by organisms that are used for communication, typically excreted by one and then smelled or sensed by another. The word pheromone can actually be traced back to Greek, but it has two parts that we should consider. The beginning of the word, pharo, comes from the Greek word pharin, which means to bear or to carry. The ending, mon, is a shortened form of hormone, and hormone originally comes from the Greek word hormon, which means to urge or set into motion. What's additionally fascinating is the history of the usage of the word pheromone and how that relates to biochemical research. The word hormone was coined by Dr. Ernest Starling in 1905, at a time when biochemistry was really just starting out. Scientists knew little about how chemical messages worked in the human body, much less how those messages could be sent between individuals. Because of this, the word pheromone didn't appear until more than 50 years later. In 1959, scientists Carlson and Lucher combined the Greek word pharin with the word hormone to define something which they felt was fundamentally different than just plain hormones. And this is where the literal definitions of the word pieces come into play. Hormones are produced inside an individual and stay there, being used for all sorts of things but pheromones are released by one individual to the outside environment and then sensed by a different individual. So using the prefix pharo makes perfect sense. Pheromones are signals that are carried or born from one individual to another. And when Carlson and Lucher invented this term, they chose the pieces carefully to reflect the thing itself. So while a formal definition of pheromone is a chemical substance produced and released into the environment by an animal, especially a mammal or an insect, affecting the behavior or physiology of others of its species, Pheromone literally means something like to carry an urge, and that is pretty wild. So because you work both clinically with patients and also as an educator, I have a feeling that you probably know some exercises that let people kind of understand and feel what's happening in this sound production. So I was wondering yeah. if you could uh, do some with me. One of the most basic things to just help people feel, feel and understand vibration is just to put your hand on your voice box mm -hmm. and hum or make a sound. Uh, mm. You can feel it vibrate. Interestingly, Absolutely. when it comes to speech, not all of our speech sounds require our voice. So when we think about sounds like S and Z, S our voice is off and Z our voice is on. So you can go you'll feel no vibration. There's nothing. Zzz, you feel vibration. <laughs> so what's yeah. fascinating is how fast our voices can go on, off, on, off. In the middle of a word, your voice might turn on and off a few times. So another thing we do in therapy awesome. that actually helps you understand too even how the vocal folds vibrate is called lip trills. And so a lip trill is like this. <laughs> yep. And you can do a lip trill without your voice on which is just air. Uh -huh. The key thing to understand there is they both require air. Just like our vocal folds won't vibrate without air, our lips can't vibrate without air. I think it is so awesome to be able to think about what's happening inside of us, for those of us that speak, and then how that might be seen in other things on, yeah. on Earth. Thank you so much for joining me and for showing us a little bit of this and how humans make that sound and talking about how other things do as well. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, so good to have you. Hopefully you learned a little bit about us and some other species and all about yeah. auditory communication on this field trip. Make sure to come back next week where we are going to break down a scientific article within the realm of communication. We will see you then. Mm -hmm.